they graced for us, so well done to Sean, so I mean not graced, but the prayer before, so um, we're just great at our leading, and then Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death, Amen. Our Lady, help the Christians. Pray Pray for for us. Alright, massive, massive topic, I'm trying to condense it, so we've got some good reading material that you can grab at the end to read up yourself, and I'll, I'll push on to further resources, but we're going to try and chop and get a whole year's worth of my own uh, prayer and study into this little part now. So, we're talking about spiritual perfection in this talk. Before I talk about what perfection is, I want to first talk about how much God demands of us. I think it's really easy to kind of slip under the radar and just think, oh yeah, if I get over Mass on Sundays and you know try not to sin that much, like that's fine. No, like God loves us way too much to like leave us as we are. He wants us to be perfect. He demands it. So I typed in on my own Bible, I typed in the word perfect, and there were like about 80 odd results that came up. And about a third of them, I went through them, about a quarter or a third of them all said like being perfect. It was all like demands to be perfect. So there's plenty of demands in scripture. These are probably the two best known. Uh, our Lord is speaking to Abraham, I am God of Almighty, Lord of me and be perfect. It's like a demand, <coughs> just do it. Right. We need to know how, realize how perfect God is. Um, and then our Lord, of course, in the Gospel of Matthew, be ye therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Um, and just in a bit of an analogy, so St. Bernard of Clairvaux, one of my favorite saints, and my profile picture on Facebook, he's, um, he's a bit of a boss, and he used to like, I mean, he got hundreds and hundreds of people into monasteries and convents in his lifetime. Hundreds. This guy was a legend. Um, and he, the way he kind of sold his people was talking about perfection and how much God demands of us, right? Um, and he just said it all the time, like, God just expects so much of us. So Dr. Peter Craft, if any of you know him, he's a great philosopher, like modern philosopher and Catholic theologian. He uses the analogy of this for perfection and like how much God demands of us. So pretend you're a student at school uh, and you fail. You fail your test, right? Your mates might laugh at you and pat you on the back like, ha ha ha, yeah mate, good job, D plus. Oh. Um, but your teacher's going to be like, hmm. Mm. But your parents, like your dad, is going to like wallop you on the backside because like, what are you doing? So the more the more someone loves you, the more they care about you, and the more they demand of you in a way. So God, our loving Father, demands from us like way more than anyone in your life. So I guess that's the um, analogy there. So talking about being perfect. So we're going to look at how the saints um, counsel us to be perfect. Right? This is like super traditional, but a massive clarification. This is one of the uh, the most missing points in in church teaching today. And it's been like this for about a hundred years now. So it's not just since the Vatican Council, which like, you know, liturgy and all this kind of stuff crashing. It's like, we're talking even before the liturgy. Uh, so this is a massive thing that we need to clarify. So please listen up. Um, I'm gonna trip on that little carpet here. Before we start, and we, we need to do some clarification. It's what Socrates always did before his dialogues. He had to clarify terms so we're all on the same page. So number one, what is religious life? Religious life, I'm not gonna, Hide the secret here, we don't have time. Like, it's, it's about religious life. Um, religious life is, there's lots of complicated definitions, but it's simply living out the three evangelical councils, and we're not talking about the priesthood here. Religious life does not demand prior holiness, whereas the priesthood does. Capiche? Uh, and the councils, what is a council? It's just like, it's a means to an end. It's not an end in itself, right? The commandments are the end. When we, when we see our Lord in the final judgment, He's going to judge us on our end and what we've reached, but the councils, they're just simply means. There's no merit in like being poor and owning nothing or, you know, being perfectly obedient unless you use that means to help you reach your end. And so the councils of poverty, uh, it was the renunciation of all goods, you don't own anything. Chastity, perfect celibacy, um, so akin to virginity, it's not just like the virtue of chastity, which is a big thing. I think I've got the council versus virtue. Um, a married man can have normal marital relations with his wife and he can be virtuously chaste, but he can't fulfill the counsel of chastity, the evangelical counsel. Capiche? Because it's a total renunciation of that legitimate good. And that is something I want to stress. They are legitimate goods, the renunciation of temporal goods, but they're still good. You know, like having stuff to own so that I can put a clothe, you know, shirt on my chest and keep myself warm. It's good. It's a good thing to have. Um, and a car so I can get to mass and work and stuff like that. They're good things. Having a wife, it's a great thing. Yeah, great. And then having your own aspirations, ambitions in life, 
they're all very good things, but it counts as the renunciation of all that for God. So detachment from the temporal, detachment of self, others, and things, so that we can attach to God and the eternal. Yeah? Um, now we're talking about good versus better. Marriage is of course good, right? Our Lord elevated the, the dignity of marriage to the level of a sacrament, which is a big deal. It's a sacrament of marriage, of course it's a good thing, and the saints are very clear on stressing that. Yes, marriage is good, but can we just take that sentence, marriage is good, and now can we forget about marriage for the rest of the talk, please? Because so many people when this topic comes up, they're saying, oh, you say marriage is bad? Of course it's not bad. You never compare something bad with something good, right? Um, there's, like, let's take a lollipop verse like, I don't know, a fallen angel. Of course a lollipop's good when you compare it to a bloody fallen angel, but there's nothing good in itself of a lollipop. Yeah? <laughs> so we only compare good things with good things. That's what the saints always say in a nutshell about uh, marriage versus religious life. And also, it's just a dogma of the church. Um, if anyone says the marriage state is to be placed above the state of virginity or celibacy, then it is not better or more blessed to remain in virginity and celibacy than to be united in matrimony. Let him be another mother. Um, so yeah, but the point of this talk, I don't want you just to think, oh, this is the dogma of the church, so let's just kind of like, out of a sense of duty and command, let's fulfill it. There's such a gap in church teaching these days on how good this is actually for the souls, right? So I kind of, in this talk, want to inspire you a bit to, to develop a love for the, the evangelical council. It's not just like, oh, it's better, the church says it's better, but I want you to like kind of develop and read about why these things are so important and why... They help you in perfection. Alrighty, so, in a nutshell, what is spiritual perfection? We've talked about a bunch of other things, like God's demanding perfection on us, but what is perfection? St. Thomas Aquinas says that the spiritual life consists primarily in charity, and if we know we don't have charity, as John says in 1 John 3, 14, he who does not love abides in death. And St. Paul says in, in the Colossians, but above all these things have charity, which is the bond of perfection. So for us, to be spiritually perfect, we need to be perfect in charity. Charity has two precepts. We've got to love God, and we've got to love our neighbor. Exactly like the gospel today. Who, who was listening? Oh, I just told you. But uh, love God and love neighbor. Those are the two greatest commandments, and that is how we achieve spiritual perfection. Now, there is a, uh, uh, a level of perfection that, we, that is required of us that is actually necessary to salvation. So obviously we're talking about sanctifying grace now. If you die with sanctifying grace, you can go to heaven. If you die without sanctifying grace, you can't go to heaven. So there is a perfection of the love of God that is necessary. So a perfection of your spiritual life that is necessary for salvation. And in a nutshell, um, this is all St. Thomas like... <laughs> um, but you've got to love God with all your mind, your heart, your soul, and your strength. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of that too is sanctifying grace. So that's what's needed for perfection of love of God to enter heaven. But there's a difference between the councils. So that's the precept. The commandment is love God, right? The commandment is to love God and to follow the commandments. And that's what the rich young man, and the story of the rich young man and our Lord, right? Uh, the rich young man goes to Jesus and says, what must I do to attain eternal life? And our Lord says, we know the commandments, the precepts, follow them. You, you've known them. And the rich young man says, oh, but I've done all that since, you know, okay, my whole life. I've done that my whole life. And our Lord says, well, if you would be perfect, See, there's a bit of a difference. So, precepts, necessary for salvation, the commandments, and just the counsel, like, well, if you want to be perfect, sure, that's eternal life, but if you want to be perfect, you know, sell everything you have and come and follow me. And ironically, out of all the times that Scripture demands us to be perfect, it's the only way Scripture tells us how to be perfect. So, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, so get rid of all, you know, personal possession, and come and follow me. You can renounce your entire will, uh, vow of obedience. Earlier on in the chapter, he talks about celibacy, and we'll come back to that. Um, so that's keeping in mind the means to the end. That's what the councils are. They're means or councils to the end or the precepts, the commandments. Capiche? We're on the same page. So number one, St. Thomas. The first way to perfection is the renunciation of temporal things, right? Uh, and I've just used that quote from Matthew 19. If you would be perfect, go sell what you possess, give it to the poor, you will have a treasure in heaven, come and follow me. Now, we can learn two things from this passage. One, the rich man walked away sad. So yeah, like, funny that. Our Lord says he's going to go to heaven because he's following all the commandments, and yet he walks away sad, right? And so, I mean, all the saints, St. Jerome, the cause of his sadness is stated, he had many possessions, which were thorns and thistles that choked the seed of the Lord's work. St. John Chrysostom also says, 
Those who possess little are not hindered in the same way as those who are bound in riches for the increase of wealth enkindles a greater fire or desire for wealth and avarice grows stronger. Basically, the more you have, the more you want to have, and it just hinders your way to perfection. Um, now, that's the first thing. He walked away sad because he owned much. That's the first thing you learned. The second thing is that our Lord later on says, when he walks away sad, oh, I tell you, it is so hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, we kind of disclude ourselves from the number of the rich because most of us you know, aren't rich. Um, we're middle class kind of people, so we, that doesn't apply to us. But no way, St. Augustine says, the disciples understood that all who covet riches, not just have them, but all who desire riches and covet riches are included in the number of the rich. Otherwise, since the number of the wealthy is small, like back then, there weren't many rich people in Jesus' time, with the multitude of the poor, the disciples would not have asked, well then, who, who then can be saved? The disciples were shocked at this. They're like, oh my Lord, like who can be saved if, you know, not the rich? <laughs> um, so, very, very hard to keep in mind. It's the desiring riches too is a massive hindrance to the kingdom of God. Um, and then, oh, just a fun little one. Um, so he talks about the eye of the needle, the camel going through the eye of the needle. It's easier for the, the camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. That is because um, the, the camel going through the eye of the needle is against like just natural law. But a rich man going through into heaven is more impossible because it is a matter of divine justice, not just natural law, which is like created and temporal in the world, but it's like divine justice which lasts forever. Um, okay, we're going to have to fly through this. So, this then is the first way for reaching perfection, that someone out of a desire to follow Christ renounces riches and chooses poverty. So, denouncing that temporal, uh, temporal attachment, attachment to temporal goods, even though they're good, it's, they're, they're good things, like money's a good thing, but you're detaching yourself from that. You have no personal possession. Second way to perfection is the renunciation of fleshly, the fleshly affection and of marriage. St. Augustine says, the less a man loves what he is, the more closely he will cleave to God. Right? And so that's why the first way, to uh, first way to perfection is to renunciate things that are external to ourselves, extrinsic to our nature, so personal uh, possessions, things like that. Like this iPhone, it's not doesn't have the same nature as me, a human. Whereas a wife... I, I can become one, I can become united to my own nature. Does that make sense? And that's why the second means, the first one's like the lower, the least virtuous, you can take a vow of poverty, it's not as good as taking a vow of chastity because you're announcing a higher thing, yeah? Your own nature, something unique with your own nature. Um, so the first thing we can learn about uh, this, this council here is that we can cling more devotedly and perfectly to God. And as St. Paul says, the unmarried man, this is in 1 Corinthians 7, the unmarried man is anxious about the affairs of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly affairs and how to please his wife. Like a, a monk would spend eight hours a day praying, a man spends eight hours a day like working, you know, in his office and getting all tired and grumpy at his kids when, they, when he comes home, you know what I mean? Um, not my dad, of course. <laughs> 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 Yeah, that's, right. <laughs> that's exactly right. So that's the first thing we can learn. Um, when you detach from that massive commitment that a wife and a family is, well, then you're, you're free. You're, you're more devoted to God. Like, it's just kind of the way it is. It's just nonsensical to think otherwise. Um, but the second thing we can learn is that uh, taking the vow of, uh, of chastity, the saints say, can subdue your impulses and passions and lust which absorbs the reason. And St. Augustine says, I know nothing which doth more easily cast a manly soul down from the tower of its strength than do the caresses of a woman and the physical contact essential to marriage. Therefore, continence is a most necessary way to perfection and is a way counseled by St. Paul because he says, Now concerning the unmarried, I have no command of the Lord, but I give my opinion as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. So, I mean, St. Paul's pretty trustworthy. Um, another thing is, uh, oh, massive clarification, because this is something that people will throw all the time. In Matthew 19, um, our Lord is talking about eunuchs, right? So eunuchs are people who, like, back in the Jewish time, like, castrated themselves to so that they were virgins forever. And only, like, men do that, actually. Um, but, you know, St. John Chrysostom said, well, in the New Covenant, we don't do that to ourselves. It's like a spiritual... Castration, like you know, taking the vow, the, the council of chastity, yeah. So, 
He's talking about eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom and blah, blah, blah. And then people say, oh, but if, if this is such the case of a man with his wife, it is not expedient to marry. And our Lord says, well, yeah, I mean, not all men can receive the saying, but only those to whom it is given. And that's why people, like a lot of people say, ha ha, well, not, not everyone can, you know, live, live a chase like, you know, the council, uh, a life of celibacy or virginity, because it's a gift, right? And like, not everyone can receive the saying. But, oh goodness, like, St. Jerome you know, kind of just laughs right at that, and St. John Chrysostom, they just say, well, he's talking about people who don't make their own effort. And then our Lord actually says, make your own effort. He exhorts it. He says, well, there are, there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs, right? And then, not only that, I mean, if that's not good enough for you, like, you're too weak to do that, well, then think about the reward. Like, if you make yourself a eunuch for the sake of the kingdom of God, there's your reward, right? So, when, when people who can't receive the saying, he's talking about people who don't actually try. And I think, you know, take this to prayer and stuff, but like, how many of you have actually, like, honestly considered that, you know? Um, could you do it? Like, have you honestly tried? Have you honestly been to a religious order and, like, spent some good quality time there? Or have you just been there in prayer and felt... I mean, that would suck. Yeah, no, I can't receive that. So. <laughs> Think about it, because that's what, this is what the saints are saying. Like, it's an easy thing to try and say, oh, well, I object. Well, not what the saints say. Um, and as well, St. Augustine, right? This is, you know, that, the famous prayer of St. Augustine. Like, Lord, make me chaste, but not yet. So this is when up here he was like a Christian, but like he was letting his passion still rule his life, and he was still sleeping around and partying, and he didn't want to physically do it. Like, he knew he should be a Catholic, but... Well, I'm not going, I'm just going to be party animal instead. So he wrote, like, uh, I think it's actually in the Confessions, he wrote this, this thing that says, um, I heard continence, like, embracing me. And continence was saying to me, like, uh, so continence was embracing my, all these vanities and, like, things like that were trying to drag him back. And the vanities were saying, oh, how could you let us go? Like, I mean, you just love <laughs> sleeping around way too much to let us go. But then continence embraced him and said, like, oh, you little peasant, like, of course you can. And then he showed St. Augustine, continents showed St. Augustine all these examples, all these examples of, of countless people who are virgins, like children, old women, um, beautifully phrased, uh, aged people with the snows of years on their brows, beautifully <laughs> phrased. Um, uh, yeah, like old men, like, oh, seriously, like continents said to St. Augustine, like, Dude, if you can't do what these old women can do, then how weak are you? Like, you're not even trying. Of course you can be chased. And grace is everything. So the Book of Wisdom says, I knew that I could not otherwise be continent unless God gave it. But St. Thomas replies to that, yeah, well, like, God will always give it. Ask and you shall receive. So if you're earnestly desiring to enter a religious life, well, and you've been struggling with this kind of thing, because it's a big deal, like, get rid of a wife and a family and all those kind of things. I'm a husband and family, you're a girl. Um, Love is love. <laughs> 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 it's a big deal, but like the saints are saying, well, A, have you even tried? And B, like it's a grace anyway, so you gotta ask for the grace. Like God's always gonna give you the grace if you ask for it. Ask and you shall receive. So that's a uh, really important thing. Uh, not all can receive this explained. Capiche? And same with 1 Corinthians 7, like he'll say, not all can receive this, but that's the answer that the saints give. Have you even tried? And I mean, grace. Can't. <laughs> Now, the third thing, the third necessary, uh, well, the third counseled means to perfection is the renunciation of your will, uh, which is the highest thing you can offer to God because it's not just an exterior thing, which is lower to your nature. It's not just a thing that you can unite yourself to, which is equal to your nature, but it is your very nature itself. The highest faculty of your nature is your free will, and that can override everything, like your intellect, your passion, and blah, 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 blah. blah. So it separates us from the animals. And that's why an unvirtuous man is actually like a beast. He's living like an animal because he's letting his passions control him. But we have a will. And if we completely get rid of that will for the sake of God, right, this is really cool. St. Gregory. He's talking about the difference between the Holocaust and the sacrifice. So what is a, what is a sacrifice if you're a Jew? Sacrifice is when a part of your flock is immolated, like a part of the victim, right? So that's, it's a good thing, and, and married people can absolutely offer sacrifices, like instead of going to bed an hour earlier, I'm going to get an hour of adoration kind of thing. So you can make little sacrifices like that in your day. Every Christian can do that, offer up sacrifices. Those are sacrifices, they're partial things. St. Gregory says you can offer a holocaust of your life, because the will is the highest faculty. So if you give God your will, you're giving him everything underneath that. 
When a man, therefore, vows one thing to God and does not vow another, he offers Zacharias, I've already said this, Judah, oh, I kind of explained it already, <laughs> better, better um, little, yeah, recap in St. Gregory. Um, there we go. We, we all call on that. No, he says that every, every um, holocaust is a sacrifice, but not every sacrifice is a holocaust. There you go. So that's helpful. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, because of that, because the, the, the vow of obedience is the highest thing you can offer to God, it's like your very self, your will, it, it makes perfect satisfaction for your sins, right? Hence we see that the religious life is not only the perfection of charity, but likewise the perfection of penitence. This is St. Thomas. Since however highness may be the sins committed by man, he cannot be enjoined as a penance for them to go into religion. For the, the religious state transcends all satisfaction. And that's why tons of people, like in history especially, I mean, you know, we're near, like it wouldn't happen at all today, but massive sinners who like, this one guy, Astolpus, who killed his wife, he was advised to go to a monastery as the easiest and best course to pursue. <laughs> for the satisfaction of his sins. Otherwise, if he remained in the world, a very severe penance would be imposed upon him, like in purgatory. So it's the perfect satisfaction for your sins you can make. It's the best way to make remission of sins. So, there we go. I think I've kind of said that. Let's move on. Now, not only is the religious life superior, as I've tried to explain there, but obviously the dogmas so you kind of have to, but a bit of St. Thomas and some of the saints just to whet your appetite a bit and make you just... Yeah, start probing and praying and thinking about things. Um, the religious life is actually a universal calling. It's not. This is the massive perception that people just have messed up in the church today. Uh, for the past hundred years, it's not just a Vatican II thing. It's like a preceding that thing. Um, we often think that our Lord only calls us to the religious life. He only calls certain people, right? Um, and that you can only really understand if God's calling you by like attraction. This was called the attraction theory. It was made by these like French monks in the, about a hundred years ago. But Saint, oh sorry, Pope Pi is either Pius the Ninth or Pius the Eleventh. Can't remember because I've given my book with it to other people. But either Pius the Ninth or Pius the Eleventh said he just completely condemned the attraction theory. Like he said, it is absolutely not necessary for you to feel a sensible attraction to be called to a particular re religious order. No way, no way at all. Because, and why? Because it is a universal calling. Now, I want to stress that it is a counsel, not a command. Our Lord is just saying, look, if you want to do it this way, you can. It's the best way. But no one's commanded to. So, like, don't feel guilty. I'm not, I'm not trying to guilt people into religious life here. But even if I am, I'm not even that mad about it. Because, <laughs> St. Thomas says... No, I'm not St. Augustine. Wrong, wrong saying. St. Thomas doth say... Those who entice others to enter religion not only commit no sin, but even merit a great reward. For it is written, He who causeth the sinner to be converted from the error of his way shall save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. And they that instruct many to justice shall shine as stars for all eternity. So, I mean, even if, like, being guilty into religious life is a means, it doesn't matter. Like, he actually even says, I don't know if it's in here, actually, but he says, he says it as strongly, like, even if Satan himself would entice you to enter religion, you should do it. Because the councils are the best way to perfection and they are good in themselves. Which I guess is a contradiction because like Satan's not good, so he wouldn't get you to do it. <laughs> um, but that's the, the point. Like any means is good enough for, for St. Thomas anyway. If it's good enough for St. Thomas, it's kinda of good enough for me too. Um, so it's a council. Don't don't feel bullied, but if you do, yeah, it's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> So how is it then that some people are married if some people, you know, if it's a universal calling to religious life? Why is it then that some people marry? Well, it's because God's will is kind of broken up into several different things. We have an the antecedent will. So on this hand, God's antecedent will. And what that means is basically God's kind of plan or will for our lives before we have a say. But of course, God's given us that beautiful gift of free will, so we have a consequent will, which is what God wills for us based on how we interact with His will and His grace. Does that kind of make sense? So a good example, antecedent will. God, of course, wants everyone to go to heaven. Everyone. But there are people in hell, and God can't do anything outside of His will, so why does God send people to hell? How can He when He wants everyone to go to heaven? Well, antecedently, of course God wants everyone to go to heaven. But, based on the free will of individuals that God has given them, people can choose hell if they want to, and if they will it, 
then God wills it. God wills that they go to hell. So yes, there's no contradiction there. You've got the antecedent will, you've got the consequent will. So antecedently, although keep in mind this is not a matter of command like eternal salvation is, it's a matter of counsel, the means to perfection. <coughs> antecedently, God wants everyone to be religious. He already does. <laughs> So there's no need for deliberation, as St. Thomas says, and a gazillion other saints, there's no need for this deliberation, like, am I called to it? How do I know if God wants me to be religious? He already does. <laughs> He's already antecedently invited you. Invited, that's a good word. Maybe not called. Well, He has called you, but it's not like you have to do it. So it's an invitation. Like, if I were to throw a party, you don't have to come to my party, but it's going to be a good party, so why not? <laughs> right? Just like the councils, it's going to be an awesome life. Why not do it? But, you know based on people's free will, they might want to get married, which isn't good, right? Marriage is good, and it's like absolutely condemned by God, it's a sacrament, all that kind of stuff. There's no contradiction, again. Um, what else we got here? Uh, the Catechism actually says this too. Like, if, if you want to doubt like St. Thomas's explanation of the will of God, the Catechism says it's for everyone. Christ, this is um, CCC 915, Christ proposes the evangelical councils in their great variety, variety to every disciple. It's not just select, select certain people that like can accept this calling, it's everyone. Uh, and the Code of Canon Law says something to the same effect. Um, St. Ignatius, a man, he says uh, there's three ways that people can know they're called to something. Or three ways people can make a decision about really important things in life. Such as vocation, like maybe you're thinking of switching job, maybe you're thinking of moving house. All these kind of things where you want God's guidance, there's three ways you can know what to do. Um, three circumstances you can make a decision. One, you can, uh, it's when God actively steps into your life and prompts you. He gives you like this, this will and this like clear understanding, a clear vision to, to do it. Right? So, um, I don't know, so, a lot of you would know Father Mark Widders, for example. Like he, if you ever hear his, um, his testimony about his, his vocation story, like he was just in adoration one day and he just saw the word like priesthood just pop up in the air. Right? Mm -hmm. Kind of like the only miracle he says has ever like happened in his life, um, but that that and he was like priest in no way, and now he's a priest. <laughs> um, but and so like I guess another good example is the disciples. Like Christ came to the disciples and said, "Come and follow me." Like I'm changing your life here. Come and follow me. He steps in, and God actually moves you. Right. That's the first way. The second way is like the consolation of the spirit and the desolation. So you'd be consoled by certain ideas, such as man, the idea like Edsel. The idea of like sitting there by myself all day in quiet is just heavenly. <laughs> and, and that idea might just give him so much like spiritual consolation um, and desolation with the idea of, oh man, like eight annoying kids. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and so God can follow you that way. Now, in my entire life, those are the only two ways I've heard presented that God will like call you. You know, whether it's a, a talk on the priesthood or religious life or, you know. This is the only two ways you ever hear about it, but St. Ignatius has a third. And St. Ignatius is the man, right? The spiritual exercises are there to discern spirits and direct people into helping, make, helping them make decisions. The third way is simply an intellectual decision. You don't have to sit around waiting for some like emotion to carry you over the line or like wait for God to like strike you with a bolt of lightning to tell you what he wants. You can just sit there as long as he says, as long as you're in a state of grace, right? Because then like you're spiritually sort of settled and you know you're in tune with God and everything. But if you're in a state of grace, and you've thought things through, you can make an intellectual decision. Just make the best decision you can. And I've probably got to say, that's the one that I would go with. Because never ever have I heard or felt God like, kind of kick me into the seminary. Um, and there's no way, like, it, before I kind of was keen on religious life, I was just thinking, oh God, just tell me what to do. Like, I'm be a priest if you want me to, but I'll also get married if you want me to. Just tell me what, I want to do the right thing. Well, you can make an intellectual decision. Of course you can. It's in the exercises, it's, uh, it's all over the saints. Now St. Ignatius has another awesome quote that I love. He says, if a person thinks of embracing a secular life, he should ask and desire more evident signs that God calls him to a secular, secular life than if there were a question of embracing the evangelical councils. For our Lord has so clearly exhorted us to embrace his councils. Like, as in it's so clear that we should, you know, we're counseled to be religious so much that we've kind of got our thinking flipped. Like everyone just thinks they're called to marriage by default, unless there's a big sign from heaven, you know, like the spiritual consolation or the, the bolt of lightning. Oh, then I'll be a priest, or then I'll be a religious. But we've got our thinking completely flipped. We've got to take the advice of the saints here. We've got to be like, okay, religious life, 
it's the more perfect way, I'll be holy, uh, yada, yada, yada. Or like, you know, God strikes me down, and, oh, I have to marry this girl now. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't suck. 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 Uh, I'll be here for one, but no, thanks for coming down. St. Thomas says, the religionis propositum, Latin's crap, but religionis propositum is the only thing that's necessary for entrance into religious life. And what does that mean? He says it's the simple resolve to enter religious life, the simple resolve to live the inner and judgmental counsel. That's all you need. You don't need to spend a gazillion years deliberating it. You don't need to, like, and that's why St. Thomas says converts to the faith, don't stop them from entering religious life. You should be encouraging them to. So what, should they live the commandments in a, in a harder, less perfect way in the world, or should they do it the easier way, like, which is what the councils kind of are. It's like getting rid of those obstacles to heaven. Should, shouldn't we just tell them to do it the easy way? That's why St. Thomas is great. I love it. So that's the only thing. Religionis propositum. It's the only thing you need. It's the only thing that's required of you. But there's only three things that should stop you, the three impediments. Firstly, debts. If you have any debts, well, you know, kind of justice says you should pay off your debts. Mm. Secondly, suitable fitness and your health. So if you're, for example, I met a monk at Clear Creek, an ex-monk at Oklahoma who had cancer. He had to leave the monastery. They pumped him with chemotherapy, and he ended up getting brain damage. So now, unfortunately, his body physically can't cope with the rigors of monastic life. And so he's got that, he doesn't have the suitable fitness for it anymore. So that's one of the three impediments that St. Thomas says which is slow down. And the third thing is which order. So before you enter, you know, like I'm, you know, you might think, oh, maybe perhaps I'm more suited to contemplative life, perhaps I'm more suited to missions or whatever it is. There's the only things that should slow you down, right? And then St. Thomas goes on to say, go get advice from people for sure, but only go to advice to people who are going to like still make you enter religious life. <laughs> don't want to hear people, don't want to hear. And there's another book too. Um, St. Ambrose, oh, this is what I've been saying, all are invited. St. Ambrose says when it comes to religious life, all are invited, not all are commanded. So there's a big difference. So you're not, don't feel bad if you don't do it, you know, but yeah. Um, so, oh, St. Quotes. Another thing, I, I promise I'll be quick, Dave. Um, a lot of people will also pull out, you know, like we're talking about uh, the letters of the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 7 and Matthew 19, where where the scripture says, oh, not everyone can receive this. Not everyone can live a, like a, a celibate life. Well, as we found out, yes, everyone actually can, if they try and if they ask for grace. A lot of people will say, oh, but God says, like, be fruitful and multiply. Yeah, and that's, of course, that's why, like, marriage is good. Christ elevated, again, to the level of a sacrament. It's a good thing. But St. Jerome kind of just scoffed all over that at the same time. He says that under the old... Under the old law, oh, I'm angry at the word for So, I rather think that in accordance with the difference in time and circumstance, one rule applied to the former, another to us, upon whom the ends of the world have come. So, the whole difference between Old and New Testament. So long as that law remain, which is be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, and cursed is the barren woman that bears not seed in Israel, they all married and they were given in marriage, they left their father and mother and they became one flesh. So that's the idea of the Old Testament. It's like, you become one in charity by like your two flesh becoming one, yeah? But in the new law, this is, uh, the time is shortened that henceforth those that have wives may be as though they had none. Cleaving to the Lord, we are made one in spirit with him. So whereas in the Old Testament it's about like becoming one flesh, in the New Testament it's about becoming one in spirit. And how do we best become one in spirit with Christ? Cancels. Cancels. Uh, and then it's just, bunch of stuff repeated. <laughs> oh, I love this. This is great. Sassy St. Jerome. Um, <laughs> uh, do you dare, so some people say to St. Jerome, like, do you dare detract from wedlock, which is a state blessed by God? He says, no, I don't detract from wedlock at all when I set virginity before it. No one compares a bad thing with a good, like a demon with a lollipop, like I'm saying. Um, now, wedded women may congratulate themselves when they come next to virgin women and they say, be fruitful, God said. Multiply and replenish the earth, God said. Like I'm obeying the scripture and that kind of stuff. And St. Jerome's saying, okay, well, fine. He who desires to replenish the earth may increase and multiply if he will, but the train to which you belong is not earth, but heaven. The command to increase and multiply first finds fulfillment after the expulsion from paradise, after the nakedness and the fig leaves which speak of sexual passion. 
Um, now also it says, in paradise Eve was a virgin, and it was only after the coats and skin, coats of skins that she began her married life. Now paradise is your home too. Keep therefore your birthright, and say, return to thy rest, O my soul. To show that virginity is natural, while wedlock only follows the guilt of the fall, what is born of wedlock is virgin flesh, and it gives back in fruit what in root it has lost. Does everyone, I read that pretty fast, but basically the result of like, you know, um, a marriage is like virgin children. So that shows how like natural virginity is, while um, marriage um, only, well, wedlock only follows the fall, it follows the guilt of the fall. So that's another thing. So yes, I mean, of course you can do it if you want. Be fruitful, multiply, go for it. It's a good thing. I'm not trying to like stop you. Just yeah, great. <laughs> um, but keep that in mind. Like that's the old law. And that's how come like women who weren't married and have kids, um, cursed was their you know, cursed is the barren woman that bears not seed in Israel. Like she was cursed in the old law. Then the new law, it's actually like the other way around. It's better, way better. Talk about Saint Augustine on celibacy. Saint Teresa of Avila. Man, I love Saint Teresa of Avila. One of the greatest saints of the church, and she said this about she she kind of did what I did. She made like an intellectual decision to enter religious life. Though I could not at first bend my will to be a nun, I saw that the religious state was the best and the safest. And thus, little by little, I resolved to force myself into it. The struggle lasted three months. When I finally took the habit, our Lord at once made me understand how He helps those who do violence to themselves in order to serve Him. I was filled with a joy so great that it has never failed me to this day. Pretty cool, right? Um, and like, I guess it's another challenge. Like, how many of you have like given three months of like trying to the Lord? You know, most of us like kind of go to adoration and just offer that up. Like, yes, I'll be a religious God for this hour. You know, but like, you know what I'm saying? Like, give it a go. Um, and the other thing in, in Matthew 19, when our Lord's talking about eunuchs and stuff, and people have made themselves celibate for the sake of the kingdom of God. Peter, the disciple, he says, well, God, like Jesus, I've done that. I've given up my father, my mother, and wife, and children. Like, I've given that all up for you. And Jesus says, yes, I know you have. Good job. And anyone who does that, anyone who gives up a wife, or children, or father, or mother, anyone who gives that up for my sake, will receive a hundredfold now, and in the kingdom of God. And I think that's just a massive perception we've lost. Like, People, we just think that giving up a wife and all that kind of is going to be the worst thing in the world. Well, no, our Lord's saying it's, you're going to receive a hundredfold now. You're going to receive a hundred times more spiritual consolation, you know, grace, just like a joyful life, a holy life now, and in the kingdom of God. So, kind of like if you think about the um, the temporality of our life, like how short, what is the next like 50 years of our life, or for some of us, like. <laughs> yeah, what is the next like how many years of our life compared to eternity like man a thousand years is like yesterday to God so if we if we can go through 50 years of so called struggle and penance and hardship and really you're going to be receiving hundredfold in this life anyway you know, what is that to eternity a glory will be greater in heaven as St. Faustina says Jesus told her in this revelation this is in her diaries Jesus said to me look at the sky and when I looked at the sky, I saw the stars and the moon shining. And then the infant Jesus asked me, Do you see the moon and these stars? And St. Martin said, Yes, I see the moon and the stars. And then Jesus said to her, These stars are the stars are the souls of faithful Christians, and the moon is the souls of religious. Do you see how great the difference is between the light of the moon and the light of the stars? Such is the difference in heaven between the soul of a religious and the soul of a faithful Christian. Big deal, your glory is greater in heaven. If we knew the glory and grandeurs of heaven, we would go through many lifetimes of suffering just to increase like one tiny little tiny degree. So what's 50 years of, you know, no wife, <laughs> no car, oh, oh, better heaven, great. Um, now the last thing I want to share, I'm wrapping it up now, so that's just some random, random saint quotes and stuff. There's plenty more in here. Saint Bernard of Clairvaux. I read his life when I was at the monastery. It was written by another Cistercian in the 1940s. Really cool. It was written as like a, a novel, more of a novel rather than like a biography. So it was dramatized but not fictionalized, if you know what I mean. Um, so it was kind of cool reading. It's not like reading a novel. But St. Bernard of Clairvaux, like what a boss. So this guy, he was 19 years old, he decided to enter a monastery. He entered the monastery three weeks later with 27 people as well wanting to enter the monastery. 
27 people in three weeks. I can't even get like one person in like three years. <laughs> and guess what? One of those people was his married older brother, and another one was his married uncle. So this is what happened. He was so zealous about how much God demands of us and how much the church needs like a you know, restoration that he managed to convince his older brother, who was married, to then convince his wife, yeah, look, God really demands this of me. Like, I have to do this. Okay, you go for it. Go enter a monastery. But St. Bernard had another older brother who was married, and his wife didn't give the consent, right? So good. <laughs> So um, St. Bernard was like, what do you mean she said no? Like, doesn't she realize how important this is? I'm going to go speak to her. St. Bernard, he goes marching up to his, his older brother's wife. And he says, let him enter a monastery. Like, the church needs this so much. Why aren't you letting him go? He had two daughters as well, two young daughters. And um, the wife said, oh, like he said, till death do us part. Uh, death do us part and all that kind of stuff. And yada, yada, yada. And then St. Bernard said, okay, fine. Well, if you won't let him enter a monastery, you're going to be dead by the time Easter comes around, and then he's going to be able to enter the monastery <laughs> with or without your consent. And she was like, yeah, whatever. And then Lent comes around. She's on a deathbed, like, towards the end of Lent. And St. Bernard, she calls St. Bernard, and St. Bernard goes after her. And she had a genuine change of heart. She wasn't just, like, fearing that she was going to die. Oh, maybe going to be right. She had a genuine change of heart, and she realized, wow, like, God actually really does want this, and... I'm going to let him go. And so St. Bernard kissed her on the cheek and she was healed. And then once she kind of like got all of her affairs in order, she also went to a convent. So leaving these two little daughters to be raised by the grandparents, right? The oldest daughter entered a convent too when she was old enough. So she is a blessed, as well as her mum. The other daughter, the youngest daughter, went off and got married. That's all we know about her. We don't even know her name. Like, she could be in hell for all we know. She still, she might still be suffering in purgatory. No, I'm serious. She might still be suffering in purgatory. She might be in heaven, but we don't know. We don't even know her name. Whereas the other, the other daughter, yeah, well, she's in heaven. <laughs> she's blessed. Um, not fallible, sure, but she's in heaven. She's blessed. Um, and so is, you know, her, her two parents are both blessed. It's, it's her uncle, Saint Bernard. Oh, it's just great. And Saint Bernard's younger sister, her too. She got married. Came all obsessed with like her rich husband and like her fancy jewels and clothes. And she went to visit St. Bernard at his monastery. He he just pretended he didn't even know her. He was so <laughs> disgusted by how gross she was in the world. Right? That and then she like went all upset, she went home crying and yeah, blah blah. And then she was like, actually, yeah, I should be a nun. And so she like also <laughs> split from her husband and became a nun. So look, while I'm not saying that's a recommendation. Like, St. Bernard had some balls to him, really. <laughs> balls of steel. Um, obviously, he had a particular mission because hundreds and thousands of men and women entered the monastery and convents because of him. I'm not trying to say, you know, <laughs> let's do that again. But that's just to show you, like, of course God calls everyone. Of course it's important. I want to finish with this. What the church needs most right now, right, is saints. The church doesn't need a good liturgy, it does, but I'm talking about what it needs most. It doesn't need good liturgy, it doesn't need good priests, it doesn't even need a good pope, right? It doesn't even need all this kind of stuff. Like, what the church needs most is saints. And the best way to be a saint, the easiest way to be a saint, the best means to the end of sanctity is to be a religious, right? All the saints counsel it, like, all of them, it's, this is the unanimous teaching of the church, uh, like, well, the, the church and the church fathers and the saints and the doctors of the church. This is so important. Like even JP2, um, you know, the king of like theology of the body, he even like talks about superiority of religious life, right? Um, so yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. This church needs saints most right now. I, I read a quote earlier today by St. Alfonso Liguri, and he said, yeah, like you can, you can draw a relation between the state of monasteries in the church with the state of the world, right? And that's why in St. Bernard's time, 10th, 11th century, there was that massive emphasis on restoring religious life. And look at what happened. The church was in the dark age, and then suddenly, boom, second crusade, and boom, there's the world, and all this <laughs> cool stuff happening in the church. Um, it was St. Bernard. Um, and like, look at the state of the monasteries today. There's hardly any, for one, but two, the ones that are there are pretty, pretty crap. <laughs> and, uh, on the whole, you know, it's pretty bad. So, and look at the state of the world. I mean, so we talk about how poisonous the world is. You know how bad it is. So that's what the church needs most, is saints. Right? So Joe, in his talk a couple months ago, um, was speaking about how one person's sin impacts the entire body of Christ. 
So there's that story in the Old Testament of the dude who, or well, the Israelites invaded the Promised Land, and they were so evil that like God said, no, you can't take anything. You can't have their gold. You can't have their houses and stuff. Just burn it off. Get rid of it. So the one, the one Israelite, he like buried some gold for himself. Thought no one was watching. The whole community got punished because of him. That's what we are. We're a body of Christ, and one person's illness will affect everyone. One person's sin will affect everyone. But on the flip side, one person's holiness will also impact the entire.